And we'll open up at the end after um, Kevin and Rob's presentations as well um, with Q and A's um, just from the chat. So everyone will have time to answer questions as well. But yeah, great turnout, guys. Um, it's great to see how many people are interested. This is our second summer webinar. Um, we'll be hosting one more a week from today at 1 p.m. Central as well um, with our partners from Fair Play USA and um, Hussey Seating and um, Full Sail University as well um, to talk about arenas. All right, so I don't see any more attendees trickling in. Um, Robert, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Thanks, Emily. Um, so I'm Robert. I'm a business development manager over at MSI, and I take care of um, esports and education um, on, on, on the for uh, West Coast accounts for, um, um, for esports. Yeah, for MSI. Great. And then um, Kevin? Hi, I'm Kevin Butler with Henderson Engineers. I'm the esports practice leader uh, for the company. Um, and we're a building systems uh, design firm uh, with offices across the United States. Great. And um, we'll get started here. Um, I have everything recorded. So if there's anyone who can't attend the whole webinar, um, this will be put on our YouTube later. Um, and just I'll let Rob go ahead and start with his portion of the presentation. Okay. And let me know if you have, there we go. So um, I think uh, the first, uh, the first question was um, for uh, 10, 10, 10, 10 systems, um, what budget it was going to be. And um, Emily, are, are you going to be asking or should I just uh, go, go through? Oh, you're muted, Emily. Thank you, Rob. I apologize. Yes. I can actually ask if you want me to, if that helps. Give me one second and I'll um, bring my questions up here as well. Thank you guys for being patient with me. All right, so um, some of the questions we wanted to start with today is um, approximately how much should a school budget um, for stations for their facility? Um, uh, to, to break down, um, we have our desktops usually starting off with the, um, the RTX 3060s. Um, ever since um, COVID happened, there's been uh, quite a lot of uh, of uh, need for video cards. Um, one, um, we had our big Bitcoin surge, and and uh, two, um, just a lot of gamers, a lot of new gamers, and I feel like a, a lot of current gamers that definitely um, have been stuck inside that drove a lot of prices up, um, especially on the video card side. Um, so right now, we're, we're 3060 systems are starting to look around around 1700 price point. Um, we can go ahead and couple those with uh, monitors. Um, we have 24 inch uh, 1440 um, and uh, 144 hertz monitors that usually go for around uh, 250. So if you couple all of, all of that, um, they uh, end up around uh, tw around twenty thousand dollars to get ten systems going, and um, that should definitely be enough um, to uh, to start off most games. All right, great. And then. Um... Give me one second. Dealing with some technical difficulties. All right, and then um, Rob, what are some of the perks um, to using MSI equipment? Yeah, I definitely wanted to go ahead and showcase some of our um, our website um, that we connected uh, with Uconnect. Um, we partnered with Uconnect and um, we have a, a website and a community on Discord as um, well as Twitch um, to support all existing and new um, schools. Um, 
what we what we like to do some of these some of these past events that that we've done um, is um, coaches corner um, that we hosted um, on Twitch um, really interactive we bring about four or five different um, coaches from um, um, uh, esports programs from around the U.S. and uh, go ahead and talk about their programs esports developments and then um, all the chat it's very interactive um, so um, uh, it, we could go ahead and uh, have a lot of uh, talk between um, all the all the uh, the attendees um, as well as the different coaches. Um, we have uh, we have events so like a student spotlight, um, which we show um, the organization um, between um, the esports clubs. Um, I, I feel like um, the organization is pretty much like the the, the backbone, and um, the students that um, are the leaders of that um, help build. Um, the programs so much. So um, it's a great way for um, existing students to see what they're doing and hopefully um, can, um, you know, copy and uh, learn um, from these events. Um, we also do some um, fun uh, rivalries um, where we go ahead and do some um, scrim matches um, for MSI Collegiate Rivals and um, also do some um, community nights as well. Um, um, once uh, and also, um, we've we've done a um, a broadcast initiative as well. Um, I think uh, when watching esports, one of the uh, the biggest things of keeping somebody entertained and uh, uh, and also just just know every, whatever is going on um, is uh, is definitely a, a big thing to, uh, to to get into esports. Um, when I started watching StarCraft. Um, the, the, the biggest thing is just, uh, I got a big, big, we're real fans of like Artosis and Tasteless and, um, you know, just, just them talking about the game, um, got me into it. And I think, uh, you know, just, uh, students learning about how to broadcast and talk about games and doing play by pace is, um, is really good. So, um, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be, uh, doing that broadcast initiative, um, um, for all of our, uh, community members, um, yeah, and should be starting very soon. Um, we also do event sponsorships as well. Um, so if um, your school um, um, that, that do have our equipment and would like to um, host an event, um, we would love, definitely love to participate. Um, uh, we, we do um, booths, we do uh, hardware, uh, hardware loaners for um, the main stages. Um, we give out a lot of swag, a lot of dragon plushies. Um, so, um, it's a lot of fun stuff and we, and, um, you know, depending on how the event is, we love to, uh, come down and set up a booth there as well. Um, and also arena sponsorships as well. Um, if you, if you guys are, um, needing some, um, uh, looking for some, uh, sponsorships for the naming rights, um, we have both forms on this website, um, that you can go ahead, um, to, uh, to fill out and connect. I know that we've had um, some competition council coaches participate in Coaches Corner as well um, as speakers so far. So you might see some friendly, familiar faces if you attend those. Um, we also share um, information in our monthly newsletter about different MSI um, activities and events too. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, I see in the chat, it asks if we can post the link to the website. Would you be able to share that here, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. I could definitely post that in there. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, I'll get that in there. And um, the next few questions we have are about specifications of different equipment. Is there anything in particular that you recommend um, for gaming or streaming, graphic design, video editing? We know as more programs are kind of getting more established, they're looking for different ways to produce content as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I made a little chart on um, what, what the games and requirements will be depending on um, what's most popular with the program. Um, you know, just to start off, Hearthstone, um, not much. You, you know, they're really good with mobile. Um, games as well. So just anything with like an I3 um, will work. Um, Rocket League um, and League of Legends, um, you'll have a little bit of uh, higher requirements. Um, FPS is definitely going to start mattering now. Um, I5, I7s, um, 1660 Supers and 3060s will be just fine. 
Um, and one of the biggest um, determinants on what the specs to get uh, would definitely be uh, refresh rate and the uh, resolution of the monitor. Um, and that usually goes um, hand in hand um, with first person shooters. Um, so Overwatch, Valorant, CSGO, um, I, I would definitely go anywhere between, because you can go as low as an i5 um, for 1080p gaming. Um, but once we go, go into the 1440p stage, um, anything with 144 hertz or 240 hertz, we could probably go with the i7 and the i9. Um, that goes the same um, for streaming as well. Um, while the video card um, won't be as um, important, um, the CPU absolutely is. Um, it takes a lot of resources on the CPU side to a stream. Um, a lot of streamers also um, like to do like a separate box, maybe uh, do like a two system type of a thing. If, um, if, a single, if, a single, if a single computer is not gonna go ahead and do just, just to take the load off. Um, so with a second computer, it doesn't have to be as strong. Um, and then also uh, with uh, video editing, again, um, we ha you have to go with um, the high CPU. Um, so um, i9s would be uh, really good for all that. Great. All right. And then um, I think someone asked if these slides would be available after this. Um, Rob, if you share this presentation with me afterwards, I can um, distribute it via email to all the attendees. Yeah, I mean, I'll get that over to you after this. Great, just so you guys can see all these great tables and everything and have this to work with. Um, is there any equipment that is specifically for esports the MSI could provide? Yeah, um, our um, 240 hertz uh, G-Sync monitors, um, I feel uh, it's definitely very esports centric. Um, one of the biggest things, especially, you know, I definitely want to keep going back to FPS, um, but uh, first person shooters really uh, matter with refresh rates um, because one, um, when you have a low refresh rate, um, when the model that you're trying to shoot um, is moving, um, if, with a low refresh rate, you kind of have to guess where they're going to be. Um, so does it, does, when you have a high refresh rate, everything becomes more smooth and kind of take the guessing game out uh, out of it. So um, is, it, is, it, is it advantage? Um, I guess, uh, yeah, it, it definitely will be because um, 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 people who are actually used to feel, uh, used with higher refresh rates um, is, I actually do feel that performance will actually be better. Um, when, when back when we, we were doing like the old 60, um, and only 70 frames. And when that 120 first came out, um, a lot of people were trying to get used to it. Um, um, but right now, now that 120 is pretty much standardized and all um, FPSs, um, having a low refresh rate will definitely have a slight disadvantage um, just because of all the guessing games, uh, guesswork that's involved. And also um, I think the G-Sync and also the FreeSync compatibility um, is very important too. Um, screen tearing um, that that happens um, uh, is, is, is definitely going to affect um, seeing the model uh, of the person that you're, you're going to um, have to shoot as well. So um, all that, all, all that, all those uh, 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 features of high refresh rates, as well as um, the G-Sync and the FreeSync, is um, very useful for esports. Great, and then. Um... Going off of equipment again, do you know, do you have any numbers for how many NACE members use MSI equipment? Um, we have quite a bit. Um, I haven't gotten um, a, uh, the full number, but I'm expecting maybe a good, at least 20, 30 um, okay. yeah, NACE members. Um, uh, for full um, esports um, uh, facilities throughout the US, um, we're coming up to up around 200 right now. Um, a big chunk of it is K-12. I would say we're good 50-50 between K-12 and higher ed. And so I'm um, very excited to see um, K-12 just uh, you know, blowing up just the same as uh, higher ed. And we're also starting to see some um, middle schools um, starting up programs as well. So those are coming trickling. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> yeah, that's great to hear um, people getting into esports earlier as well. Um, it's wonderful. And what should an institution keep in mind when purchasing new equipment? 
Yeah, so um, I think one of the biggest things um, in terms of uh, finding out what to um, decide to buy um, would be one, figure out which game is most popular um, within the program, um, whether that be um, um, Overwatch or League, um, wh whoever's excited, uh, whatever's excited and what the students want to play, that will determine um, the number of systems. Um, whether that be uh, 10 or 12, uh, whether it be a five or five or a six on six. Um, from there, um, I think uh, if, if, you, if the program is going to be hardcore or casual, um, the peripherals will matter a lot. Um, um, you know, it's a, the keyboard and mouse is just like a tennis racket. So um, it's, you got to have something that uh, the students will be comfortable with. Um, it's a big determinant of performance. Um, so having um, the, the right keyboard and mouse that, that students will be comfortable with um, because, um, you know, you don't want students always kind of be uh, coming in um, every day because they probably practice um, at the school. And of course, they're going to be playing at home and sometimes you don't want to be bringing in and the keyboard and mouse all the time. Um, two, um, the length of time of how long you want these um, systems to last. Um, so I do a lot of recommendations on what type of specs and it, whether, um, you know, working with the IT department to determine, hey, these have to last for three years before the next refresh or four years before the next refresh um, is very important. Um, um, we have a really good knowledge of, uh, you know, just what publishers kind of uh, go uh, release and the requirements of it. Um, so we're able to get really good estimates um, um, on that. And, um, and um, yeah, that's about, that's about it for me, Emily. <laughs> Great. Um, and only one other question just from the chat, if, if you can answer it right now. Um, <clears throat> Kyle wanted to know, does MSI have regional offices around the U.S. or is the organization only located on the West Coast? If you could answer that for us. Yeah. Um, so so um, MSI, we are a uh, worldwide brand. Um, but right, uh, and with uh, locations all around the, the world. Um, but our in our US, we only have one headquarters. Um, we are located in Los Angeles. Great. And um, Rob will also be participating in our technology session at the NACE National Convention coming up here in July. Um, so, you know, we're excited to have him again. And we will. Um, ask more questions of him later during the open Q&A, but we'll give him a break for now and move over to Kevin from Henderson Engineers. Kevin, if you wouldn't mind, could you introduce yourself again just for the people who've jumped in? Yeah, sure. I will share my screen here real quick. So yeah, so anyone that uh, joined late, um, my name's Kevin Butler. I'm with uh, Henderson Engineers. We're a building systems uh, design firm with offices across the United States. Um, the primary focus of the, the presentation that I'll give today, I have you know, about 10 or 12 slides that I'll, I'll run through here quickly, will be a, a brief overview of the NACE uh, physical build guidelines document. Um, as well as key points uh, related to building systems that you should keep in mind um, when you're planning to repurpose an existing space for an esports facility. And then also some key items to, to keep in mind related to uh, security, as well as if you're considering uh, broadcast or casting for your, uh, for your facility. And um, just to interrupt real quick, that documentation, um... I can share out with whoever's interested after the presentation as well. Um, I believe we have it, access to it on our website, but I can send a direct link um, to anyone who's interested. Great. Yeah, there's a lot of great information in there and um, I'm not gonna go page by page, but uh, just hit some of the high points. So prior to uh, last year's uh, national convention, we expanded the physical build guidelines for varsity esports spaces. Um, that was originally developed by Populous, um, which is an architect uh, headquartered here in, in Kansas City. Um, so we added guidelines for building systems in order to, to make it a more holistic document um, to assist schools during the uh, planning and conceptual phase of, of building out their esports facility. So the, the way the document's set up, it provides uh, tiered templates for 
uh, build out of collegiate esports spaces and the the different tiers work is uh, a kit of parts and there's a, a narrative description that accompanies each tier along with the system guidelines and a uh, layout for a suggested um, build out. So the portion that uh, Henderson engineers uh, focused on of the, the guidelines, um, the system guidelines uh, included are mechanical, electrical, plumbing, uh, security, telecom, audio, video, broadcast, and acoustics. So depending on uh, the system specific guidelines were included uh, for typical spaces that were included in the, the space layouts that, that Populous developed uh, to better represent how we typically um, see or envision these spaces functioning. Um, most of the space specific guidelines uh, focused on the acoustics and audio video systems, since they're generally the, the two systems that have more specific guidelines for individual spaces. So an example from the document is, is shown on the right. Um, so this is the from the acoustics guideline. And as you can see, um, there's various criteria for the different spaces. So the uh, analyst studio has more strict criteria versus the, the gaming area as it relates to uh, acoustics. So one thing I always like to remind people about is with any guidelines document, um, the included information is, is general rules and suggestions since each facility and individual program are gonna be different. Um, so there could be different uh, requirements and needs for each various space and program, which would dictate different requirements. Um, so my contact information, as well as Brian Merakian's contact information from Populous is included in the, the document. Uh, so we encourage you guys to reach out to us if there's any specific questions so that we can assist with, you know, whatever the specific needs are for your program or your facility. So outside of uh, general the general gaming floor where you know the stations are going to be located. Um, a lot of the other spaces we get a lot of particular questions about our support support spaces. So the different tiers uh, include layouts uh, that include additional uh, spaces outside of the, the gaming floor. Um, some of the general spaces are shown on the screen. Um, so depending on uh, the size of the program, a separate space can be provided um, for each different function, um, as shown on the screen that each, uh, each function has a separate room, um, or the program functions can start to be combined into to one space. The, the building system guidelines could be different for each of these functions, so it's important to keep that in mind when planning a space that will serve multiple functions, either day one um, or in the future to allow for the facility to operate effectively for multiple years. So as an example, you know, spaces used for streaming or casting or other content creation will require increased sound isolation and reduced background noise from, you know, mechanical equipment to improve the quality of the audio recording. But those criteria, that criteria isn't um, required for a head coach's office or a war room or any other support space. Also, you know, additional AV systems, such as an interactive display are typically required for a war room or the, the team conference room um, to allow the team to review and analyze game or practice footage um, and strategize for upcoming matches. But, you know, those AV systems are typically not found anywhere else in the, the AV or within the esports facility. So it's important to keep those um, intricacies of the, the various functionalities of the different program um, in mind when you're trying to combine them into a single space. So the guidelines are applicable to repurposing of an existing space or for new construction. Um, we're seeing a lot of esports facilities um, repurposing existing spaces, whether at the collegiate or professional level. Um, one of the projects we were involved in was Esports Stadium Arlington, which I'll show some pictures from here. Um, which was repurposed uh, existing space in the Arlington Convention Center into the largest dedicated esports facility in North America. So a, a couple items to, to keep in mind when you're repurposing an existing space for an esports facility um, are, are the power. Power is very important component for an esports facility. 
not only do you need to consider the power for the, the actual gaming stations um, and the number of gaming stations that will be in the facility, but also any additional technology such as you know, large displays. Depending on the previous use of the space, uh, sufficient power may not be present to support all the needs or wants of the, the plant facility. So general power guidelines were outlined in the guidelines document, but the specific requirements will vary for each space depending on the, the quantity of gaming stations, as well as the uh, additional technology that is incorporated into the facility. The next big one is, is cooling. Um, with all of the added equipment from you know, the actual computer to the monitor, to the TVs, to any other technology, um, there's a lot of heat that is added to the space. Uh, it's important to understand the capacity of the existing system when going into a, a repurposed space, since the original design likely didn't account for the additional load that is gonna be needed for all this additional technology. So this is one of the main areas that, that we typically see get overlooked when repurposing an existing space uh, for esports, which can lead to occupant discomfort um, since the system can't uh, properly cool uh, the space. So it's important to understand if uh, additional mechanical equipment is needed early in the planning phases of a, a project when uh, building out an esports facility, since they can have a large effect on the, the project from a budget standpoint, as well as depending on what equipment is needed, uh, there may be space planning required for the physical location of new equipment, uh, which may also lead to structural concerns, especially if that equipment has to be located on an elevated platform. So uh, it's very important to figure out the uh, power and cooling um, for your space early on. So technology systems, you know, bring esports facilities to life. I think everyone uh, realizes that. Um, when planning what systems are desired for your space, not only do you need to think about the, the power and the, the cooling loads, um, but structural also needs to be considered, especially if elements are going to be suspended from, uh, from the ceiling or uh, from the structure directly. So this is typically a larger concern uh, when the space will support uh, tournaments, uh, since those events typically desire the use of large displays such as direct view LED and a high uh, SPL sound system. Um, so it's important if, if your space will have those capabilities um, to, to think about that as well, uh, what effect it has on structural in addition to the power and cooling needs. So having an early understanding of what an existing space can support will better outline what the required budget is to repurpose that space into an esports facility. So the telecom infrastructure, this is the backbone of any esports facility, um, regardless if the project is new construction or repurposing an existing space, it's important to discuss the internet service provider connection early in the project. You know, what bandwidth um, is available from that connection? Are redundant connections uh, available or required? Um, and answers to those questions will vary depending on the needs of your space um, and what all you're doing in your space. Is it tournaments? Is it streaming? You know, uh, what level of, of broadcast um, do you have in your facility? Most universities will be tying into their campus networks. So we always recommend making friends uh, with the campus IT department and having early conversations with them, uh, since that's crucial to try and work through any firewall or security issues in order to reduce any uh, bandwidth concerns with tying into the campus network. So another area that sometimes gets overlooked is the wireless network, especially if the space will facilitate uh, tournaments. The esports fan, as well as college students in general, um, or the most connected um, individuals. So a, a robust wireless network is, is required to support the fans during a tournament uh, while they're on their social media and other applications. So flexibility, um, esports facilities are, are still new. Uh, esports in general is still always evolving. 
Um, games are continuously evolving, whether that's with new characters, updates, or new releases, and there's new titles that are always being added. So due to that, the biggest challenge we try to tackle is making sure that the facility remains flexible for the future. Um, this not only from a space planning standpoint and layout standpoint, but esports will likely be early adopters for new technology. Um, so that needs to be considered when designing an esports facility. Specifically, additional considerations need to be given when designing pathways for all building systems, since additional or uh, new cabling and or uh, additional power or cooling may be required to support the new or added technology as the facility continues to grow. Providing this flexibility will allow the facility to not only operate on day one when you open, but also many years down the road. So security, um, this is one topic that uh, can always be an afterthought, can sometimes be an afterthought and may not be at the, the front of mind, but security should be a high priority in an esports facility. Um, this not only includes player safety if you're hosting tournaments, but there's also a lot of expensive equipment, um, whether it's in the public or private areas uh, that could be stolen or damaged. Um, so the, the potential for damage definitely increases if there's food and beverage present in the facility. So that's something to keep in mind. It's important to have a well thought out risk mitigation plan uh, and security procedures in place so that staff can be properly trained uh, to keep the facility uh, secure. So some specific items that we always recommend uh, to consider related to, to security as it relates to an esports facility uh, is having a reception desk or an area near the exit where a staff member can be stationed. This will help monitor and control those who enter and leave the facility. Having sufficient video surveillance camera coverage throughout the facility is, is desirable to document uh, any activity in case there is any damage or any theft occurs. And it's also important to include access control on areas where expensive equipment is stored or located to restrict access to a limited number of people. So broadcast, as an esports program develops, you know, we see this, we see them adding or expanding systems uh, to support broadcast and streaming and casting. Um, this is a very large and, and broad topic um, and requirements for each program will differ depending on your budget, your desires, your available staff to support the systems and even the amount of space you have within your facility. So when approached with questions about these topics, we, we find it best to have a detailed conversation to best understand the, the specific requirements of the program, which then will help lead us to identify the appropriate system to meet um, your personal needs. But some general questions to consider when thinking about uh, adding specifically casting um, to your facility are, does a, a dedicated space need to be provided for this use? Um, if so, will the space be used for other content creation? Um, if so, providing sufficient sound isolation will be, an import, will be important if that's the, the case, as we, we mentioned above with the, the stricter criteria. Um, so what system is in place to allow casters to view the game footage? Um, are multiple views uh, from the game required for the caster? That'll depend on the game title. Um, how many cameras are planned for the casters? If, if multiple, how will this be controlled? You know, that's typically dictated by the number of casters you're going to have, whether it's going to be one or multiple. Um, what is the plan for lighting uh, to provide sufficient light for the, the individuals on camera? Um, that can sometimes be an afterthought and, and people forget that, you know, there needs to be sufficient lighting. Otherwise there can be shadows or different things, um, you know, on camera. So this is definitely a, an exciting area. Um, or a portion of the esports market um, that we're excited to see grow since it's it provides additional opportunities um, within the, the esports market and will allow individuals to develop skills that translate to, to other professions. Um, so one thing we always remind uh, different esports programs is, is when adding or expanding these systems is it's important to reach out to others on your campus 
um, such as the graphic design department or the film and media uh, studies department to see if the cost of the equipment can be shared since those programs will likely uh, either have uh, equipment that could be potentially be shared or could use that equipment as well um, for their academic programs. And also the idea of shared equipment or, or, or shared expense for the equipment can also be true for the gaming station since uh, many programs such as you know, engineering or architecture or graphic design can benefit from the performance um, of those computers. Um, so this can also be uh, allow for non-gamers to become aware or even get involved with the esports program on campus. So this is very beneficial um, if there are plans to continue to expand or um, grow your broadcast, casting, or content creation portion of your program, since that will make that endeavor much easier with additional uh, interested individuals uh, available to help out. So that pretty much covers the, the main topics, the, the high points from the, uh, from the actual physical build guidelines document, as well as some things to keep in mind as it relates to, to repurposing um, an existing space. Um, so my contact information is on the screen. Um, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of these items are, uh, or questions are very detailed and they require uh, usually some follow-up uh, conversation. So feel free to reach out. Um, we'd be happy to, to assist you um, as you plan your, your esports facility. So thank you. Hey, thank you, Kevin. Um, so before we open up the Q&A portion, I am just going to drop my email down here real quick in the chat, just in case if there's something we can't answer today um, that's pressing or something that comes up later, here's my email if you need to contact me. So there's my email. And then if you would like to participate in the next webinar, which is next week at the same time, you can sign up there. Also, Kevin, would you mind sharing your slides with me and I can distribute those as well? Yep, I can do that. Great. Um, so how we're going to do the Q&A portion, if you have a question for Kevin or Rob, if you want to type them in the chat, and I'll um, just call on you to ask and you can unmute yourself and ask them questions. See if everyone's shy today. Or um, if you don't want to type them in the chat either, feel free to just go ahead and ask. Um, just we'll ask that everyone takes turns as well. Actually, Emily, I have a, I have a question. Sure. Um, we're fairly new. We're a uh, we're we're going to be starting up our esports program this year with the NJCAA. Um, so we're we're in the early stages of looking at outfitting a specific room. Um, obviously, space on our campus is very uh, limited. Um, but question: Is there a difference? And by the way, if you know, I, I don't know too much about the gaming world, but uh, so this is fairly new to me. But question pertaining to systems: Is there a difference between a gaming laptop and a gaming uh, desktop? Per se, is one better than the other, or is strictly desktops? Um, Rob, would you be able to answer that? Yeah, there's. Um, that's a really, really, really good question. Um, so there's absolutely a difference um, between a gaming laptop and um, gaming desktop. Um, so um, the video cards that are actually in the desktops um, compared to a laptop, um, the names are exactly the same. Um, you're going to have RTX 3060, RTX 3070. Um, there's, there's no difference in the naming. Um, but performance, you're looking at about a 15 to 20 percent drop compared to their actual, um, uh, if you have a laptop. So if you have a laptop that's a 3070, it's going to be about 15, 20 percent less performance compared to an actual uh, 3070. 
um, into in the um, in the actual desktop. Um, a big reason of that as well is because the CPU performance um, they have the same um, the, the the names are are, are different, but um, you know the performance of an i7 in the laptop is not like a desktop i i7 as well. So um, you're definitely going to hit a, a a performance dip and um, pricing um, um, again. Um, um, now they're they're about the same. The pricing's all a little wonky, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, um, yeah, it's definitely a big uh, drop in performance. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Jennifer. Is the panel aware of how campuses are funding the facilities from design and breaking ground to operations? Um, she's curious about the financial models. Um, if we're aware for campus facilities build, is that, Jennifer, is that what you're asking? Yeah, thanks for taking my question. Um, so I'm a faculty member at University of Washington and I study college sports. Um, and I teach a class on esports. And so I'm just curious if the panel you know, in their institutions, um, you know, these are approaching the, the funding of the facility itself. Um, so from what I'm aware, it differs from institution to institution. Um, I hope I hope I'm answering your question correctly. You cut out a little bit. Um, but I know that um, as far as what Kevin went over with Henderson engineers um, with different tiers, different um starting points for different institutions could you speak to that at all kevin yeah so i i agree with your statement because each uh university is different with you know where the esports program lives you know whether it's uh under one of the individual schools say the school of engineering or uh student life or the student union or athletics so um, the actual location of funding is uh, is very much a variability, and then the actual tiers, um, the the funding and budget for the individual tiers that I I discussed is a large variable as well. Um, within the the document, uh, there was a a basic budget provided for each tier, um, but you can easily go way above uh, that investment for each tier. Because um, it's going to come down to, of course, you know, the, the amount of space, um, as well as the you know, number of gaming stations, the amount of technology. I mean, especially once you start getting into much larger spaces, um, you know, you can easily, you know, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just on a LED wall if, if you wanted to go that route. So um, there is, of course, as I mentioned, with the guidelines document, there's a lot of caveats. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely a variable of um, what budget we see for esports facilities is where is as well as where that funding um, is coming from, since it'll be dependent on you know where that esports program lives. And I know that, and don't get me wrong, I'm relatively new. So if there's anything I'm speaking to that doesn't quite make sense, um, I would love to follow up with you um, later as well um, with the rest of my team. Um, but I know that there's a lot of institutions that are anywhere from having to repurpose an area um, in order to have an esports space, having to scrounge together electronics to be able to make things work to institutions that will start building an entirely new building from the ground up. Um, so I hope that gives you a little bit of information, Jennifer. Um, if we move on, um, Don Montgomery asked if, there are any minimum space design guidelines for a beginning esports program. Um, again, that might be speaking to Kevin's um, the tiers that he was speaking about earlier. Um, but I also know that there's for to be a NACE member specifically, there just needs to be a dedicated space for esports. Um, really, it depends on the needs of your program as well. Um, Kevin, are you able to share um, kind of the info, more info about tier one? Yeah, so I, I'm assuming from the question that, or I'm, I'm wondering if from the question, if you're wondering what the minimum amount of, of square feet you need for a space, 
Um, as it relates to that, uh, that's definitely more an architectural question that uh, populists would uh, probably be uh, better suited to, to answer. Um, but uh, in general, um, the, the tier one that we uh, have outlined in the, the document, it's 2,500 to 5,000 square feet. So, and I'm, I'm sure there's spaces that are even smaller than that. It really comes down to what programming and, and functionality, because um, if all you have is, you know, 10 gaming stations, you probably fit it in a, a smaller location to, you know, just start up the, um, the program. But um, of course, as you add functionality to your program, the, the, the required amount of space is going to have to increase from there. Great questions, guys. Um, feel free to keep them coming. <laughs>